All right, great. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and get started. Um, Sam Cave is with us from New Hampshire Food Alliance, and she's managing the, the slides today. So if you could forward to the next slide. So today we're working with Andrea Tomlinson, who's the general manager of New Hampshire Community Seafood, and Gabby Brott from um, UNH Cooperative Extension New Hampshire Sea Grant. And um, Gabby's gonna talk with us first about the work that she does and some of the research, and then um, Andrea will follow, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type them in the chat. And there's a little icon at the bottom of your screen that looks like that black box with the, the chat function. You can just click on that and type in your message and um, the presenters will be able to see your question. You can also, at the end, raise your hand by clicking the little hand icon and um, we can unmute you if you wanna ask your question out loud. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Gabby is going to talk with us about her, or actually it looks like Andrea is going to talk with us first. Okay, great. Hi everybody, I'm Andrea Tomlinson. I'm the general manager of New Hampshire Community Seafood, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we do and why it's important to eat local seafood in New Hampshire. So we are a multi-stakeholder cooperative, which means that we have two different kinds of shareholders. One are one are our fishermen and one is our direct consumer. And what a community supported fishery is, there's only about 50 of those in the United States. We're one of the 50. And we are pretty much like a CSA for fish, community supported agriculture model for fish and seafood. We have um, predetermined memberships that folks can buy into for both spring and fall sessions. And that would be our consumer driven model, which is the community supported fishery. And then we have a restaurant supported fishery where we have chefs and retail markets buying our fish directly from us. And they're able to provide their consumers with the name of the boat, the name of the captain and the um, origin of the fish and where the fish was actually landed. So in this day and age, traceability is really considered a value added product in this industry. So we're really proud to say that we can trace back every ounce of our seafood to the original supplier and where it was landed. So like I was saying, a community supported fishery is like a, is like a farm share for fish. Um, our particular model runs seasonally here in New Hampshire from April until December. And we have two sessions, as I had mentioned, a spring summer session and a fall session. And what we're doing is we're buying directly from the local fishermen and the um, lobstermen and crabbers, oyster farmers as well. We are giving them a fair market price for their fish and an incentive. And we are distributing to, as I mentioned, the direct consumer in the form of the CSF and the restaurant supported fishery as well. So members can receive a two pound, a one pound or a half pound share per week for the fish. We also have shellfish shares, which um, include oysters, uh, oysters, scallops, lobsters, and crabs. And we do require you to have a fish share in order to receive the shellfish share. So a lot of people don't realize that the Gulf of Maine has a plethora of ground fish species available. We have one of the um, largest variety of ground fish in, um, in the country here in the Gulf of Maine. So these are some of the types of fish that we, that we sell. And what we're really trying to do is promote the underutilized fish, formerly called trash fish, which were byproducts and bycatch of the cod industry. So we do sell Gulf of Maine cod, albeit very infrequently because our cod quota has been reduced to 3% of what it was 10 years ago. We sell Atlantic haddock, Atlantic pollock, Monkfish is an incredibly abundant fish right now with a very high quota for our fishermen. Acadian redfish, which is um, actually our New England grouper species. We sell American place, which is a form of flounder, affectionately called dabs by our fishermen. Uh, Gulf of Maine yellowtail flounder, white hake, king whiting, Gulf of Maine winter flounder, and dogfish shark, um, also affectionately called cape shark. So just a few pictures of the before and after product. This is Atlantic Haddock. 
the um, the smaller species of haddock referred to as scrod haddock has really come back in abundance and we've got a really high quota for that fish this year for our fishermen um, are able to catch quite a bit of this Gulf of Maine haddock in the form of scrod. Those fish tend to be about two to three years old in age and we have a real high quota for those this year. We're taking advantage of that. We offer haddock every week for our fishermen. So this is the, the live whole species of haddock on the left and then the cooked product on the right. So it looks like, um, Andrea, someone has a question here. Okay. Um, it says, uh, Maryland has their True Blue certified program for traceability of crab. Does New Hampshire have something similar? We do not. And I was actually just on the Maryland-Virginia border um, with that larger coastline. And I'm sure Gabby from New Hampshire Sea Grant could attest we have a lot more funding for those type of programs and a lot more focus on that, um, on that type of model. But there are some different, um, there are some different certif certif certifiable branding, um, how would I put this? So MSC is one, Marine Stewardship Commission. There are some organizations that do focus on certifiability and traceability, but we do not have that in New Hampshire. Any more questions? Okay. So going from haddock, our very good looking fish, to one of our not so good looking fish on the outside, but really good tasting on the inside. So this is monkfish. This is a benthic species that's associated with the bottom of the ocean where cod and all of these species live that I mentioned previously. Monkfish is a very well-managed species through the National Marine Fisheries Service. That's who manages all of our brown fish um, you know, limitations and, and catch quota. And this is monkfish before and after. A lot of people say if they had seen it before, they wouldn't eat it after. But this fish is referred to as poor man's lobster. It eats basically crustaceans, crabs and lobster. And it tastes, and as you can see, looks very similar to lobster tail. That's monkfish. I'm just trying to feature some of our more underutilized species here. So this is dogfish shark, otherwise called cape shark. This is an incredibly abundant species of a very small shark species in our Gulf of Maine. Um, everywhere you go, the fishermen are saying they're getting into dogfish. There's quite a few of them out there in abundance. Um, they have been known to eat cod juveniles, so it's a great fishery for our fishermen to utilize. Um, not only can they can they land 6,000 pounds a day, but they're feeling good that they're getting a potential predator to the cod juveniles. Now, the money that our fishermen are getting for this fish is, is quite minimal. So what we like to do is bump up our price um, to them when we're buying dogfish shark in order to provide them with an additional incentive. By the way, dogfish shark is one of the most utilized species for fish and chips in England. So on the right is a, is a typical fish and chip in England, UK, and dogfish shark, they call it rock salmon over in the UK, and it is most uh, frequently used for fish and chips there. One of our other superstar underutilized fish is Acadian redfish. This is our New England grouper species. A lot of folks can't believe this is actually a New England fish because it does look quite tropical on the outside. Um, this is a deep water grouper species that is found typically offshore in New, ha in New Hampshire, um, definitely about two hours out steam wise, about 26 miles out. This fish is found on Jeffreys Ridge, George's Bank and beyond. This is a real popular fish with our restaurants. Uh, this picture on the right is from one of our superstar chefs, Dave Vargas, at Vita Cantina here in Portsmouth. And he does wonders with our fish, especially our red fish. This is a lovely, sweet, flaky fish. It's a favorite of our members' children. Children, if you're trying to break your child into eating fish, I suggest this one the most. It's sweet, it's flaky, it's a very thin filet, and it's incredibly palatable. So traceability, I had said before, has really become a value-added product in the, fish, in the fishing industry and in the fishery world. 90% um, of our seafood that is, that is arriving in New Hampshire is imported. And conversely, 90% of our seafood that is landed in New Hampshire is immediately exported. 
Um, of that imported fish, up to 70% of that can be mislabeled at any given time. So traceability is a really important factor um, in the fishing industry. And we are really proud to say, like I had said before, that we can trace every ounce of our seafood back to the origin. Um, as I had mentioned, we only have eight ground fishermen fishing here in New Hampshire. We do have a weekly newsletter for our members, our consumers. Every Monday, I write a newsletter telling you who caught your fish, what the catch of the week is, and where it was landed. And again, that traceability factor is so important for our restaurant consumers as well, because on the board, if it's available, or the menu, the specials menu, our restaurants can provide their customers with the captain's name, the boat's name, and the port that the seafood was landed in. Always fresh, never frozen, by the way. Um, the minimum time that it takes for us to get the seafood from the dock to our consumer, um, we've, we've done it actually the morning of and gotten it to the consumer that day. The maximum time it takes for us to get it from dock to dish is, is 48 hours. So like I had said, 90% um, of our seafood is exported out of the state upon landing and 90% of our seafood is imported in New Hampshire. So there's a, there's a number of really important reasons why we should be supporting local seafood. Um, first and foremost is that it is supporting the dying industry here in New Hampshire. Obviously fishing is part of our heritage and our culture and we are down to just eight ground fishing boats. That would be boats fishing for fish, not lobster. So when I say ground fish, I'm referring to um, boats that are fishing for fish exclusively. We have a number of lobstermen who are catching both lobster and crabs, but what we're really um, concerned about is the depletion of our ground fish fleet. So first and foremost, when you're buying local seafood, you're supporting our local New Hampshire fishing industry, and therefore you're supporting our local economy. You're also getting an incredibly fresh product that's never been frozen, that again, you can trace right back to the source of landing. And that's really an anomaly in these days, being able to really trace your seafood back to its origin. Um, the other reason I feel that it's really important to eat locally is it's what our forefathers and foremothers did. And it's really, um, I feel, kind of a social responsibility for us to look to local seafood here on our, sea, on our New Hampshire coast and look to that seafood for our consumption as opposed to something that's been imported and quite likely frozen and thawed a number of times. Like I mentioned, the fishermen do get a 50 cent incentive on every pound of fish we buy, and that goes for our oyster farmers, our scallopers, our lobstermen and our crabbers as well. They also get that incentive above and beyond the fair market price for that day. Our fish shares, as I had mentioned, come in two pound, one pound, and half pound shares. We have a little bit um, more updated labeling situation this year. I apologize for this slide, it's a little bit old. Um, we do have two pound, one pound, half pound shares going out to our consumers each week. The fish is purchased from the fishermen along the New Hampshire seacoast at Portsmouth, Rye, and Seabrook Harbors. It is immediately transported to our processor in Summersworth at Tri-State Seafoods, where it, where it is then cut into fillets and bagged and delivered Tuesday through Saturday. As I mentioned, we also have a shellfish share available for fish um, share members, and that includes locally harvested oysters out of Great Bay. We have 16 oyster farmers currently growing oysters in Great Bay. We buy from Virgin Oyster Farm in Dover. We buy scallops um, when, they're in, when our fishermen can catch them here in New Hampshire, which is January through April, and then we source them regionally in New Bedford. We buy local lobsters from our fishermen along the seacoast and local crabs as well. And those are our four offerings for our shellfish share. As far as membership options for the CSF, we offer annual memberships, which are 32 weeks in length from mid-April to the end of November. We also have a 16-week and an eight-week uh, membership option and then for the month of December we do a fun local seasonal holiday medley share where we offer a local seasonal option each week for the holidays. Our restaurant supported fishery um, is really thriving and going really strongly this year. We have approximately 20 restaurants on board each week many of whom have a standing order each week. 
we have partnered with a wonderful group called the Three River Farmers Alliance, which is essentially a local seacoast food hub. And they have uh, vegetable producers, meat producers, bread makers, honey makers, chocolate makers, and we are proudly their seafood contingent. And that is an online app for uh, restaurants, institutions, and retail stores to, um, to basically source and order local foods. So we're working with Three River Farmers Alliance to grow our restaurant-supported fishery. Obviously, this is great for the traceability factor for the consumer and also helps promote our underutilized species. And it also acts as a form of outreach and education to the public. And that's all I have, folks. This is our wonderful former delivery driver. And this is me in a fisherman sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, Tommy Lyons, board member on the right, and Colin Barnard, veteran fisherman on the left. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so feel free. Oh, it looks like maybe we have a question here. Um, is there a list of restaurants that purchase from you? Yes, on our website, under the Restaurant Supported Fishery tab, you can click on um, participating restaurants right there. Thank you for asking. Yep, and you can feel free to continue typing questions in there in the chat. Um, if we don't get to them before Gabby starts, then we'll circle back around um, after she finishes up. So uh, we'll turn it over to Gabby. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I am. Uh, sort of getting myself settled here. <laughs> um, yes, I'm Gabriella Bratt, and I am a fisheries extension specialist for uh, UNH Cooperative Extension and New Hampshire Sea Grant. Um, and I essentially, um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit more on um, a little bit of what Andrea uh, had spoken to before. And uh, she and I actually do several, uh, several things together throughout the year um, as we try and support the idea of um, encouraging consumers to eat more underutilized or less well-known species. So I want to give a little bit of a background um, for New England fisheries, uh, sorry, New Hampshire fisheries. And uh, so basically, since the inception of New Hampshire back to colonial times, um, we have had a very um, big connection to our fishing industry. Um, and it's been about 400 years, and it's only a tiny little coastline that we have, but yet we've been pretty productive um, for a long time. And partially, uh, the, dif the difference between New Hampshire and other New England states is that we were actually established for the purpose of um, commercial enterprise, and the dominant industry at the time uh, was fishing. So um, all along, the New Hampshire fishing industry has actually relied on the ground fish species that Andrea spoke, to, spoke about a little bit. Um, and we really were almost a mono-species-centric uh, mono uh, uh, type of fishery for, for many decades um, and, and years and focused mainly on Atlantic cod. So what exactly are ground fish? Um, ground fish, as um, Andrea had introduced you to, a, a few of them, um, are basically those species that are associated with living on the benthos or near the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they are typically of great economic importance. However, uh, they are actually pretty vulnerable to exploitation through overfishing, and that has occurred uh, in the past 50 years or so up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, more recently here in, in the Gulf of Maine, um, but you may be aware of the cod crash um, up in Canada, that where they're still recovering from the loss of that fishery. Um, currently, the Northeast Multi-Species Fishery Management Plan from National Marine Fisheries is what regulates the commercial harvest of the 19 Northeast, Atlant uh, Northeast ground fish stocks. Some of these um, species include yellow, like um, Andrea had said, the, some flounders, some um, uh, redfish, dogfish, um, and then all of the gadoid cousins such as haddock, pollock, and cod. So a little bit more of, of the background here. Um, 
New Hampshire is located in the middle of some of the world's most historically strong fishing grounds. And even better, we have two major estuaries, the Great Bay Estuary and the Hampton Seabrook um, Estuary, both which are important habitats for uh, diverse marine life and also as um, early nursery stages for um, the fish that we are interested in. So uh, for a very long time, New England fisheries and New Hampshire fisheries seem limitless. Um, and uh, we, we reap the benefits. We had a very thriving uh, fishing industry up and down New England um, and in New Hampshire. And um, unfortunately, in the last 30 years or so, thanks to the increased fisheries pressure brought on by Americans loving their seafood, um, an increase with demand, um, we have seen uh, overregulation um, and uh, overexploitation of some of our of our most prized fishing stocks. Um, and additionally, we have seen um, uh, fishing technologies that have um, advanced, making fishing a lot better and easier, and also degraded environmental conditions. So the levels of groundfish stocks that we used to see back in colonial times really are no longer existent. Um, so, and Andrea had also mentioned, um, you know, that we are basically back down to only eight ground fish fishermen. And I can, um, my next slide is going to uh, demonstrate a little bit, this a little bit more. So, um, ground fish in 2017 accounted for about 19% of the total New Hampshire commercial catch compared to 50% of the total catch in 1997. And cod accounted for only 1% of the total catch compared to 18% in 1997. Lobster landings, on the other hand, have increased dramatically in the same time period, from 13% in 1997 to 73% in 2006. However, we're starting to see that even that industry is starting to feel the effects of, um, of warming waters and um, overexploitation. Uh, so, uh, we are seeing in the 2017 data, which is the, actually the last data year that we have access to, um, where the lobster landings began to decline in the state and they only made up about 53% of the total catch. Um, so you can see from these, uh, from these graphics that um, the total catch in New Hampshire has um, basically turned from a ground fish fishery, if you look at that first, um, that first graphic over here, and you continually see the orange is the lobster industry, and you can see how it has sort of pulled away in the last several years, last 15 or so years, um, with 2016 being one of the highest, um, one of the highest uh, landing years for New Hampshire lobster. And the cod landings, as you can see on the top um, blue chart over there, that um, has continually and, and declined and extremely rapidly um, in 2013 to almost 70,000 pounds total um, for the year in 2017. Um, and yeah, next slide please. So um, the economic impacts of New Hampshire's fishing industry um, seems to be, um, the economy is far less reliant on the fishing industry as it used to be historically. Um, and it only provides a small portion of the overall economy. The economic value of the catch in 2016 was $30 million, but only 0.3% of that was contributing to the New Hampshire economy, total New Hampshire economy. The latest data from NOAA, which was in 2012, showed that the New Hampshire commercial fishing industry directly supported approximately 5,000 full and part-time jobs at the time. Unfortunately, we don't have those data currently. Um, however, since 2012, our iconic fishery, especially the ground fish fishery, has been wallowed. And I alluded to some of the reasons um, a little bit earlier. So yes, my next slide. Um, so since I started working at UNH Cooperative Extension, so that was around 2012, um, these are the headlines that we have been seeing. New Hampshire's uh, changing fishing industry is the last of the fishermen um, and so on and so forth. So a lot of it has to do with, um, with some of the, the issues that I mentioned previously, better and larger ships being able to access more, um, more fish more rapidly, uh, bigger industry, uh, 
companies being able to take over and buy more quota, as well as a different management um, regime for ground fish. Uh, this, sec uh, sorry, this sector management or catch shares is what has really affected New Hampshire fisheries in the last 10 years. Um, initially, we went from how many days at sea fishermen could go out and collect uh, and go fishing to something called um, a sector management or catch shares. Uh, and that has basically been deemed by many, including our own fishermen, a failure. Um, so a little bit of a timeline here. In 2012, we started seeing restrictions on the cod catch, um, and that cod catch was restric restricted even more in 2013, and uh, making our ground fishery consolidate more and more because it wasn't worth for them um, to go out fishing if they couldn't actually catch um, their big money makers. If A, it didn't exist, or B, their quota was so small. Um, so currently we have five to 15, um, 15 ground fish fishermen that are considered active. However, um, that can change throughout the year, but essentially we're on average having eight ground fish fishermen uh, being able to go fishing. Um, we also are seeing the effects of warming water temperatures, overfishing, and um, I'm gonna put this one a little bit on the consumers, uh, the consumers demanding the same five species all year long. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just to you know, harp on that a little bit more, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea what seafood consumption in the United States sort of looks like. If you notice, these are the top 10 species that people eat. Um, the number one species is shrimp, um, followed by salmon, canned tuna, I was actually surprised about that one, um, but I shouldn't be, <laughs> uh, tilapia, Alaskan pollock, um, uh, pangasius, cod, crab, catfish, and clams. And these are the top, the top 10. Um, when you look overall, according to the 2017 NOAA report, Americans are consuming about 16 pounds of fish and shellfish per capita. Um, which is another, which is an increase of 1.1 pounds up from 2016. So we are actually getting a good amount of seafood into us. Um, Americans really love their shrimp, their salmon, and their canned tuna. And 102.2 billion dollars were spent on fishery products. Second only to China is where the United States comes in in terms of our appetite for seafood. Um, so we love our seafood so much that we're actually going into debt over it. <laughs> As uh, Andrea had mentioned, uh, in New Hampshire, we land our catch and almost immediately most of it gets uh, sold abroad. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we hope to, to start changing or are working to change through programs like the uh, community supported fishery or you know, buying direct from the fishermen themselves is to keep more of our seafood here um, in the United States, but also into, um, in New Hampshire, and also trying to get people to eat something other than shrimp, salmon, and tuna. So what, we're the, what Andrea had said was we have a diverse population of fish that we could eat from. However, we are not. So there's a disconnect between the American consumer, seafood consumer, and the actual seafood that we actually have. Um, so what uh, we do in um, New Hampshire from New Hampshire Sea Grant and UNH Cooperative Extension and what we're trying to do to um, help New Hampshire fishermen, consumers, and our fisheries is to explore other opportunities that aren't necessarily related just to ground fish. Um, some of these are considered out of the box, um, looking into um, into aquaculture. So Andrea mentioned that we have 16 oyster farmers here. So these are not naturally harvested oysters. They are actually grown in Great Bay. Um, and it is one of our big success stories here in New Hampshire in terms of the aquaculture industry. Um, and then we're also exploring um, how we could grow seaweed here in New Hampshire. Um, and also something called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture which is essentially doing a multi-species arrangement um, where you grow seaweed, 
um, some sort of shellfish, in our case, blue mussels, and some sort of fin fish, in our case, um, steelhead trout, and, uh, and grow them together so that you can minimize the, um, eco the ecological uh, damage and footprint you would leave behind as um, some of the bigger uh, species-specific uh, aquaculture um, setups. Do. So the other types of things that we look at is how can we encourage and educate people to eat everything else other than tuna, shrimp, and so on. Um, and this is by working with restaurants and New Hampshire Community Seafood and others um, to promote um, and to promote these underutilized or less well-known species, specifically here in New Hampshire, redfish, dogfish, pollock monkfish, um, and also soft shell lobster, which uh, is actually a, a real thing. And um, it's amazingly good and delicious, especially if you like to eat your lobster hot and not cold by the time you get through the hard shell. And uh, one of the things that I'm primarily working on um, currently is uh, green crabs. Next slide. Next slide. Did you? Oh, she did. Okay. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we do is uh, using research on some of these other some of these other less um, less well known um, uh, species and aquaculture. We also do a lot of outreach and education to create new markets. So and also to try and explore new fisheries. Uh, we since we grow our own kelp as part of the integrated multi-trophic aquaculture setup, uh, we have come up with educational uh, workshops and materials to teach people how um, they can actually incorporate seaweed into their diets, where you can forage for them, how you could uh, cook it, dry it, process it, etc. Um, and the same with, with mussels and so on. Uh, I had mentioned the, the green crab work. The green crabs are, um, are invasive and they, ha they came over from Europe about 200 years ago. And again, as a result of warming, uh, of warming water temperatures here in the Northeast, um, and actually from the East Coast all the way up to Prince Edward Island, we've had this incredible rise in their population. And while it's a crab and it's edible, it's actually causing a lot of ecological and economic um, damage to uh, some of our uh, pretty lucrative uh, fisheries, including in the lobster fishery, mostly because they're a nuisance and they take up a lot of time and energy to get them out of the traps, and it also eats all the bait for the lobster. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, in Maine and um, in Massachusetts, we've seen the loss of millions and millions of dollars in the soft shell clam industry uh, to the point where um, where people have tried to come up with different ways to protect their 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 shellfish beds from these uh, crazy hungry uh, green crabs. So one of the things that we are working on is trying to figure out markets for green crabs. They are edible. Um, they are a smaller crab, so it's uh, you can't. You really pick the meat from it. So we are working on establishing um, a soft shell crab market here in New England and in New Hampshire, where you can very similar to the soft shell blue crab industry down south, um, and they are delicious and um, and could potentially be an additional source of income for for lobstermen or fishermen or anyone trying to get into fishing in general. Um, so one of the ways that we've been doing that is, again, doing research on molting patterns and behaviors for these crabs so that we can direct the fishermen or anybody interested in doing this um, to areas where there's a high um, density of these crabs that are molting at different times of year. So we've been doing a lot of research in that respect. Um, and then partnering up with chefs and even New Hampshire Community Seafood um, to introduce people to this new, basically it's a new, a new delicacy, a new seafood product um, that we can get right here um, in, in New Hampshire without having to import anything. A soft shell crab, preliminary, preliminary data have shown from um, our work with the chefs, uh, can bring a good size crab about three inches across can bring in about $3 per crab, not per pound, per <laughs> crab, which 
if we have so many of them and we can get the soft shell volume up, um, we, it could be a potentially very, very good situation. So I don't know how I'm doing for time, but my next slide, I guess I can wrap up a little bit, um, is essentially um, by creating new avenues for our fishermen and our fishing industry, whether it be through aquaculture, uh, production of new species, or exploring other, um, other more interesting and less uh, and historically less valuable uh, species, such as these invasive green crabs, um, we can um, allow our fishermen to continue to make a living off of marine resources, in particular ones that are underexploited. So in this case, for the green crabs, we have a lot of them. There's a lot of biomass, um, and there could be a lot of potential uses for them either as a culinary ingredient or as bait or as compost. Uh, the, the possibilities for this is, is sort of endless. Um, while at the same time, uh, giving a positive, having both a positive effect um, on the ecosystem, allowing other, other species to come back, and also um, you know, giving a boost sort of to the, the economy for our fishing industry. While at the same time, consumers can then enjoy um, another traceable product, a homegrown delicacy um, that will also keep our fishing industry thriving, if not, well, not thriving, alive. <laughs> um, and again, helping to uh, bring our ecosystems back and giving them a little bit more resiliency. So I think that's all I have. I'm open for questions if anybody wants me to expand on anything or. Great, thank you so like much, that. Gabby. Thank you. Um, while you're thinking about questions for Gabby, we did have two questions at the end of Andrea's presentation, um, somewhat related to what Gabby was just talking about. Um, so she talked about some of the challenges that the um, industry is facing in this area, but is there anything that um, you didn't mention or that Gabby didn't mention that you want to? Do we have all day to cover? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how long do we have? Um, <sighs> Okay, I'll add a few. So we have, and this will lead into our next question, we do have a situation going on nationwide, and particularly here in New Hampshire, called the grain of the fleet. Meaning that our older fishermen are graying out and retiring, and we don't have a lot of motivated young blood coming in. We also have challenges with folks not understanding the cost element involved in, in buying local seafood. So the average cost of a pound of fish from New Hampshire community seafood is $14 a pound. Of course, it varies according to how long you, you purchase your membership or, you know, the longer you purchase for, the cheaper it is. But, um, you know, people will say to me, but I go to Hannaford and, and, and Mark a Basket and I see Haddock or Pollock for $7.99 a pound. Well, that is an imported, that is an imported fish that is caught in mass quantities. And what we're doing here in New Hampshire through New Hampshire Community Seafood is we're supporting what we call our day boat fishery, which is the guys who go out at early in the morning and come back in, in the evening. We only have one boat that's big enough to go out overnight. We call that a trip boat. So what's happening is because we're cooperative and we're offering an incentive, and of course we have overhead costs, we don't process ourselves, our product tends to be a little bit more expensive than, than, than a market basket or a Hannaford product. However, if you go into a seafood market, uh, you know, Sanders and Seaport, for instance, here in Portsmouth, um, Philbricks, um, Fresh Market in Portsmouth, any, any seafood market that's directly um, selling seafood in particular, our prices are very comparable. They really are. Um, another challenge would be getting into institutions where we have institutional buyers who really want to support our program. We can't meet their price point. Um, we just can't with a local species that's caught by day boat fishermen. Because remember, we're paying our fishermen the fair market price for the day, which fluctuates. So those are two big challenges. And to go along with exactly what Gabby just presented, the consumer's palate is so geared towards those, those three top species that Gabby mentioned. Um, shrimp, salmon, and, and canned tuna. And canned can tuna. I, but I guess one of the things that I, I, makes me laugh is that people are like, oh, I love fish and I love seafood, but I don't want it to taste fishy. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of those 
um, a lot of those uh, species are some of the more milder fish. And what people don't realize is that uh, a lot of the, the cod type fish are also mild, white, flaky fish. And, uh, you know, they don't, people don't really know that pollock is almost as good, if not better, than cod. And, um, and then some of the other species that are available. It's just introducing people and having them willing to, um, to try it. And we actually, a few years ago, we did a, it was almost a blind taste test. It was essentially we had chefs really good chefs from Portsmouth prepare the same species of fish and we just called it different things <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we completely get it it was dogfish and we then surveyed the people who tried all of them and you know the answers we got were were really interesting because a lot of it has to do with just the name mm -hmm. so people say dogfish I'm never going to eat that but that Cape shark was delicious or that, you know, New Hampshire whitefish was amazing. It was all the same fish. Mm -hmm. So it's really just introducing um, consumers to a more, um, to a more variety of species and, um, and getting more of them <laughs> as opposed to just mm -hmm. the regular uh, locavorin uh, foodie types. Correct. Right. right. So we got a couple more questions in, but I want to make sure we circle back to um, this question here about what's being done to cultivate a new generation of fishers, because there is some interesting uh, work happening on the ground, and Andrea has been a real champion of that, so she can um, she can talk a little bit about that. That is such a fabulously apropos question for the three women in the room, because we are certainly collaborating right now to develop a New Hampshire Young Fishermen's Alliance. Um, because as I had mentioned before, this is a national phenomenon. I was in with Gabby at a seafood summit in Norfolk in 2016. And we did a field trip afterwards down to the Outer Banks. And I realized speaking with a lot of um, commercial fishermen there that this grain of the fleet is happening there. And I've since, you know, been speaking with fishermen up and down the East Coast. It's happening all over our nation except for Alaska who's putting a lot of attention on their young fishermen. So what we're trying to do here currently, as we speak, is get some funding together to develop a New Hampshire Young Fishermen's Alliance where we can not only train um, young men who've been in the industry since they were youth right out of high school, but also provide um, a greenhorn training, so to speak. Greenhorn would be a term they use it on, um, you know, Wicked Tuna and on the deadliest catch a lot. A greenhorn is a fisherman term for someone who has no experience in fishing. So what we'd like to do is do a, a, a greenhorn training to um, get youth, men and women outside of high school who have just graduated and or, you know, in their 20s and 30s who are looking for a different trade, we'd like to train them in the fishing industry to be stern men and women for both ground fishing and lobster boats. So we're working on that really hard right now. It's one of my biggest passions. Great. Thank you. All right, so we have a question here about composting. Can you talk more <laughs> about the composting of the green crabs? <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, something a couple of other, um, other uh, people that we're working with in the region um, are looking into. Uh, basically, we're trying to figure out um, what the exact composition of a green crab uh, organic compost would look like. Uh, one of the issues that we have is um, how do you deal with all of that, all of those um, uh, crabs and, uh, and the shells, et cetera, and trying to make a viable compost that won't completely stink out the whole entire area. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, it is, it is a little bit wasteful to have um, to trap these crabs and then just send them straight to a composting facility. What else could we do with those before we um, we put them into into a composting facility? Uh, there's a couple of people who are uh, essentially mushing them up uh, anyway and taking any sort of leftover uh, waste products. So a lot of the just the shells, etc mushing them up and they're trying different, um, different compositions of it, how much crab, how much other, um, other brown material, and they're doing field trials on, on that end of things. 
But if you actually catch any of them and you don't want to eat them or they've died on the way home or whatever, um, I, I do it at home and I just put it in a, in a bin and I, uh, and then I bury it after a while. And then, um, it's one of the, it, it's very similar to, um, to the lobster and shellfish compost in that it, it does have a lot of good nutrients and people swear by it. They say they had the best tomatoes they've ever grown and so on. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely potential there. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I don't know how to pronounce this term here, but there's a question about killing methods and um, helping prolong freshness of the fish. Oh, okay. So yeah, what is the term? Is it the sushi kill term? I K E J I M E. Yeah, Yuki Jimmy. So yeah, so that's how that's how you prep a, a sushi fish. Okay, so we do hikijimi for the dogfish shark, and when I was talking about the fishermen getting a really low price for that, the reason for that, unfortunately, is, as Gabby was indicating, we can't get American consumers really, really interested in eating dogfish sh shark currently. We're working on it. The Cape Cod Fishermen's Alliance is working on it down on the Cape, and another, uh, a number of, of people along the eastern seaboard are trying to introduce Cape, Cape shark. We like to call it Cape Shark because it just sounds a little bit more palatable than a dogfish shark. So Ikijimi is a, is a bleeding process for anyone who doesn't know. Um, that's a common um, way that you would bleed a fish to produce a sushi product, a sushi uh, grade product. So I happen to used to work at Great Bay Aquaculture and we used to do this process on flounder quite a bit. So what it entails is you're cutting the jugular up at the neck and you're cutting the, the, the large vein that runs down to the, to the tail and you're bleeding those fish out. So we actually do do that for our dogfish shark because sharks don't have a bladder and they urinate through their skin. And that tends to make the flesh taste a little bit on the nitrogen ammonia side if you don't do ikijimi processing with it. So our guys will take the head off, take the tail off, do the ikijimi bleed, and then they'll soak it in an ice water brine on the way in. And that absolutely increases the shelf life of the product. It increases the quality of the flesh and it does increase the taste of the product as well. Um, it depends on the fishermen and their particular practices on board their individual vessel, whether they do that same process on the other ground fish. I do have a fisherman who does ikijimi on his cod and his pollock and they always get top dollar at the portland auction so that is that's a great question great um, it looks like those are all the questions we have at the moment um, so thank you so much gabby and andrea if anything comes up in the next uh 30 seconds while i'm wrapping up we can we can jump on that but um the food alliance is hosting uh, we host a free webinar every month and the next three months will be focused on climate change and different aspects of climate change resilience and adaptation um, and strategies related to the food system. So keep an eye out for details about that. And um, the webinar is recorded, so we'll post that on our website and email it out to all of the participants. Um, and so if you missed anything, you can go back and see the slides there. We usually post um, a PDF of the slides as well, so you can download those if you want to look at the graphs again or any of the pictures. Um, oh, we also have next month, actually, we have our, thank you for reminding me, um, webinar on compost and food waste diversion. So um, September is about compost, and then October, November, December are about uh, climate change. So thank you so much to everybody who attended and um, please email us if you have any questions. <laughs>